I will put your panel on. I over give it to you. Thank you very much for everyone. Hi, thank you, and I welcome uh, Wolf Khan. I see you, Wolf. You just uh, deboarded your plane, I think. Hope you found a good place here to, to tune in. Um, and I see Nicolas, Nicolas Weber. Hi. Hey, pleasure to be in, here. I think in Portugal and Philip, Philip Zimmerer, probably in Berlin. No, Portugal as well. Portugal as well. Everybody's in Portugal. In the sun. <coughs> Wolf is in the car. Great. Hey, guys. Hi. Uh, our topic today, we have 30 minutes. So I could do a very quick intro of, of uh, the panelists. Or our topic first, are DAOs the future of fundraising and the corporation itself? Um, we want to have a quick chat into the opportunities and challenges uh, around this new form of organizational governance, for instance, the approach, how is it actually done? We have two experts here who did it firsthand, let's say. Um, uh, the legal topics around that, and Wolf is, uh, as a professor, uh, uh, very, very deep into that uh, topic and did also publications around it. Uh, and also some issues around the management um, that come up. Uh, where you, Philip, and Nicolas also have really hands-on experience, I believe, uh, from the recent launch of the uh, of the DAOs. And um, maybe uh, let me start with one um, one uh, a quote from uh, from Wolf. Uh, I found that in a Coin Telegraph um, uh, publication. He says. Uh, once DAOs are jurisdictionally recognized, they will likely replace significant portions of existing business constructs. With this development, it is possible that intellectual property issues under existing law will resurface in the DAO context. That's one uh, statement. I just throw it in here. So uh, this highlights, so to speak, also um, that uh, not everything is rosy and uh, we probably won't, um, uh, let's say, move um, without any friction into a world where uh, the DAO with those communities uh, that are investors, but also contributors to a new form of organizations uh, arise, that this doesn't happen, let's say, without any friction. Um, with that, uh, maybe uh, briefly, uh, Nicolas, um, would you, or Philip, uh, whoever wants to go first, would you want to give us a brief overview on your project um, uh, and how you actually um, uh, established the DAO? Um, what, what do you see in it? Why did you go that way? Uh, and, and maybe also, what, where are the challenges? Who wants to go first, Philip or, or Nicolas? Philip? Go ahead, Philip. <laughs> sure, I'll go first. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm a core contributor at, the, at Spool Doll, and the purpose of Spool, uh, in our opinion, really lends itself to uh, a DAO managed concept. And that is because Spool is uh, permissionless middleware. It's essentially a smart contract stack that allows the uh, composability, that enables composability for stablecoin DeFi while also uh, allowing um, the to grow with the expansion of the DeFi ecosystem. That means that any new yield generators or uh, innovations in this nascent industry coming up can be included seamlessly in our, our stack while existing users uh, just uh, benefit from growing economics of scale by tapping into DeFi through Spool. And because it's a permissionless uh, stack of uh, smart contracts, it's essentially a permissionless uh, revenue generating protocol that uh, thrives on the addition of new strategies uh, based on DeFi primitives uh, being included. And that sort of uh, stack needs to keep growing and it needs to grow, <clears throat> let's say, uh, independently of personal opinions. So we need sort of unbiased governance and now we have a product that can be used by anyone without requiring anyone's permission. 
while still uh, being reliant on growing and adopting to an ever-changing, uh, quickly growing industry. And uh, that's essentially almost made for wisdom of the crowds kind of approach. So uh, plugging uh, or growing that through a DAO just made total sense. And yeah, so me yeah. and a group of other people started it together. Yeah. Yeah, I've been following that and I've also, let's say, experimented with the DAO as I'm also one small contributor there. But while doing that um, and following this launch uh, process, uh, I also realized that uh, we had, for instance, in, in the, the funding uh, period here, um, a very large contributor um, who basically uh, bought in with a big stake. So uh, I can imagine uh, that this is also, um, yeah, uh, raising questions about uh, who is behind that, what influence will they take, and how do you deal with these um, uh, topics there? Well, actually that was pretty much dispelled immediately because it turned out that was a pool wallet done by a private group that was then dispersed into 40 to 50 different wallets. But what it does do is it raises the question, what if it wasn't, right? What, what if it mm -hmm. was one single person? And that is what, uh, a core reason why DAOs needs, need to be bootstrapped with that in mind, right? A capital mm -hmm. takeover in early stages. And that is why uh, during the funding period, the LVP, we have only had a small portion of the total token supply reserved for that. And a large portion will just go out to users of the protocol uh, in different ways, shape or form. I don't want to get ahead of myself there, but this will be announced very soon. And uh, there are certain methods that you can employ to ensure a decentralized distribution of your governance token, which you also need. But then there's a whole host of other issues that we, it's kind of a kind of uh, worms that we're opening here, right? Because then you need to ensure that the people participating in your DAO actually care about what they're voting on. So you're kind of, uh, then you have problems with voters' apathy and so on, right? So, okay. yeah, let's we dive deeper. I want to integrate in the discussion now, Nicolas, maybe from, from your perspective here with uh, Meta Game Hub. Um, so, uh, maybe you can give us a brief uh, overview of that and uh, why did you choose the, the DAO model? Why did you adopt it? What did you do uh, to launch it? And uh, briefly, maybe a few of the the challenges there that you uh, face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so in regards to Meta Game Up DAO, in a nutshell, what we do is we have like two core pillars, right? We have on one hand the pillar A, which is focusing on, let's say, establishing a decentralized, so to say, country in the metaverse, and therefore, though, following a metaverse agnostic approach by, you know, acquiring metaverse assets in different metaverses, such as the sandbox, such as the central land and others and then basically collaboratively governing them. Because while people always talk about the open metaverse and the metaverse generally as something that's decentralized, they are, at least when it comes to land ownership, fairly centralized still. And um, of course, here we, as, as Meta Game of DAO, as a collective want to, let's say, foster the decentralization by also then building culture hubs as well as game for ecosystems on top of the lands that we have in the treasury. And on the other hand, um, the second pillar that we follow is the the pillar of like you know developing tools that help users navigate through the metaverse so for instance one tool is the the central and land editor which is about to be launched which is kind of like a pendant to the game maker which the sandbox has um in the central and it's not yet as easy to build so to say stuff right like in the sandbox for instance another tool that is already live is the evaluation tool so we've developed an algorithm basically that allows you to uh, have find, first of all, undervalued lands, right? And, and for instance, the sandbox as well as the central land, but also mainly allows you to then evaluate your respective land or the land that you want to potentially acquire. So that's interesting for single land owners or for larger players. And um, of course, you know, um, when it comes to such, a, let's say, yeah, I mean, you know, topic that's like hype, like the metaverse, the one challenge, for instance, that we had was, okay, what metaverse do we actually start with, right? Because, I mean, there's not going to be one metaverse to rule them all, but I think here the DAO aspect is, is quite crucial because you have kind of, you know, these great minds coming together, collaboratively governing the directions also, first of all, the tools, as well as generally the governance of 
of what happens with the lens, right? And this then also subsequently led to other people also from universities in Germany, like the Metaverse Development Team, which is mainly coming, for instance, from the Aachen region and the university there um, to join the DAO. And, and it creates like an open space for everyone to kind of shape what happens within the metaverse. And that's kind of also the core angle that you want to follow, right? That while, of course, the land ownership may be a bit centralized and the asset prices are just crazy appreciating, we do have to focus on the actual users that will populate the lands. And that's where we want to come in because right now we may have that layer one, so to say, hype in the metaverse with these, with all the land sales from the different metaverses. But what's really coming next are the applications as well as the communities that are built on top of the lands with these applications. And that's the two angles where MGH comes in. Yeah. So, so there you want to basically leverage this concept of the DAO that uh, you, you, you have this, uh, the users more or less, this community being also the owners of the whole, uh, yeah. or partly owners uh, of the whole ecosystem. Now, uh, maybe to you, Wolf, um, when you hear this uh, firsthand, uh, let's say, experience here from two founders who recently raised a significant amount of money, both in the millions. I think Philip was the result recently, like uh, 21 million or so, and uh, also a seven digit figure here with uh, Nicolas uh, to get this thing uh, off the ground. And when you uh, look at, or I also, from my uh, background, let's say, uh, come more from a uh, VC uh, perspective um, to this uh, over the recent years. Um, what, what's your take on the whole topic? Uh, I mean, I brought your, your initial statement, so you're very positive about it, but uh, how, where do you see the opportunities and challenges? So first of all, um, congratulations. Um, can you go, guys all hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes. congratulations to Nicolas and Philip. Um, great accomplishment. Um, let, me, let me start out by saying DAOs are only as good as their governance, right? Um, so if, if, if you haven't managed to decentralize your governance, DAOs will, any DAO is subject to the same, exact same dynamics that we see in centralized systems. So that's what, where I spent my, my last 10 years uh, building math models to accomplish this, uh, this very idea of decentralized governance in autonomous and anonymous systems. And so um, I spent the last three years working with the DefX DAO to implement that exact design. So um, Philip and Nicolas, I, I would invite both of you to consider applying for grants to experiment with this design. Um, but even if you decide not to do that, let me say a few words about the issue that Oliver identified um, as to what... You're breaking up, unfortunately. Can the others hear him? ...was able to buy... You were breaking up shortly. Yeah, please repeat yep. the last sentence. Okay, so this Thank idea you. of buying influence, right, is yeah. antithetical to any decentralized governance. Mm -hmm. So if you allow governance token to be purchased on DEXs, you are literally inviting attack vectors that are, that are so massive that as soon as your system has significant TVL, somebody will inevitably think about attacking that system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the academic literature, <clears throat> we call that Arrow's impossibility theorem. Among, among several others. Um, so in order to avoid this very phenomenon, I mean, people have in, are incentivized to do this to you, okay? In order to avoid this particular um, um, phenomenon, one, one needs to, in, in my opinion, and this is what we've written the book about, um, one needs to consider decentralized governance and that starts with uh, non-fungible tokens, right? So you use only reputation um, um, metrics uh, that can be NFTs, it can be a credit system, it can be weighted, uh, weighted keys um, to account for the merit that people put into the system and how to get people to, um, to start engaging with the community. So mm -hmm. in other words, you are people who engage with the community get non-fungible tokens. The more they engage, the more they vote, um, the, the more reputation tokens they get. And they're paid proportional to these reputation tokens, right? And so it's a to two token design. And I know that's not sexy, Philip. And um, I know that 
many uh, venture capitalists are looking at this and are, are saying, oh, no, no, we want, a, we want a utility token and we want there be, to be governance rights to incentivize the community. And that's all fine. I understand all these arguments. The problem is once you have, have significant TVL um, and you use a governance token that, that can be bought on exchanges, you're opening yourself up for, uh, for all these attack vectors. And that is, especially in the very successful projects, is something that uh, in the long run will not only haunt them, it potentially will destroy them. And so if you look at the, the trajectory, trajectory that we have with DAOs, we have now about uh, 10,000 DAOs around the world. It's probably going to be at 50 to 100,000 by the end of the year. Um, there's a lot of DAO washing going on. Yeah? So we know what greenwashing is and DAO washing is the same thing. People use this term um, that doesn't revolve around DAO governance to raise funds. And that, that is understandable. Uh, unfortunately, breaking up. Right? Nobody is critiquing that the problem is and it's wrong. If you don't have decentralized governance, all these projects are subject to these attack vectors. And if I was an investor, I, I would really want to know about this. I could go on and on, but I'll end here. <laughs> yeah. No, very great insights, I think, uh, Wolf. Um, and I know I'm, I, I, I didn't know about uh, the, the, the project here um, uh, you mentioned. Um, and uh, what what is your take, basically, uh, Nicolas, Philip? Who wants to go first? Yeah, Nicolas. Yeah, I can I can take this. I mean, I fully agree with Wolf, and um, I mean Vitalik right also wrote an article about moving away from token based governance models. So like it's it's something that has to come right uh, because at the end of the day, I also don't like necessarily the term just governance token as as like a secondary market traded token that's just out there and can just be utilized. Generally, also from a legal side, if you launch a token, <laughs> I mean, governance is always more a security than a utility token. You can have a DAO where a utility token is like functioning as an oil within the DAO's platform and can even, at least in the beginning, maybe have an impact per se on the governance, you know, also to have potentially, let's say, some more access to fundraisers and stuff. But in the long run, right, if you really want to have a sustainable model, I fully agree with Wolf that there should be reputational, mainly reputational based you know, metrics that influence the governance, right? Um, that should be based on the impact and the influence that you have and not your economic stake per se uh, within the DAO, right? I, I think the balance here is really the key, right? Um, so it, it's something for everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, that's definitely something that we're already looking at uh, with MGH, maybe to give some <laughs> alpha. We are about to launch like a, a community pet NFT series in, in MGH where the ownership of this this pet series will then also have an impact actually on on the governance, right? Um, so so we are already kind of going into this direction in a gradual approach. Yeah. Cool, Philip, your your uh, take. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think to be honest that uh, economic incentives do somewhat. Like they can influence uh, um, governance behavior to a to a very very large degree, and by that I mean that like we have to separate kind of the TVL of platforms, right? What what Wolf said is absolutely correct, but you have to uh, separate sort of the TVL in terms of what what's the governance token lockup, and in the term in in the case of Spool, for example, what will be stablecoin lockups that are routed through Spool that are not kept by Spool? So the governance token is responsible to um, sort of set the metrics and the parameters under which the uh, spool smart contract stack operates. So it could, for example, vote in new risk models, vote in new uh, DeFi yield generating strategies and so on. But what it can't do is ever touch or influence the TVL that is actually flowing through it. So we always have to think about when we ask a question of what attack vectors are we opening ourselves up to? Uh, I think the first question to ask is what could an attacker potentially achieve. And then we need to design our governance model around uh, discouraging or in the best way, closing off these attack vectors entirely. So um, I think, uh, yeah, Wolf, sure. So, so that, that is Arrow's impossibility theorem, right? So uh, Philip, you're, you're right with the approach. The problem is any stable and presumptively optimal governance uh, scheme is subject to Eros impossibility theorem, which basically says that as long as it's stable, people will find find ways around it and destroy it. 
right? So um, <clears throat> as an answer to that, in order to, to address this issue, you have to create dynamic evolutionary governance in DAOs, mm -hmm. and the technology actually allows this, right? Now, it's way too much for this short conversation to, to dig into how that's possible. But Philip, I would, I would like to encourage you to, we can continue this conversation offline. There are Absolutely. ways to do this and to do it right, okay? And that sets us up for the future of decentralized commerce, in my opinion, because that's what DAOs ultimately are for. Great, uh, great uh, discussion and, and great comment. So, um, Essentially, the, the problems that we face in centralized organizations, um, uh, we face them in, in the DAO context um, as well. And the challenge I see really is uh, that we have a lot of enthusiastic um, uh, founders here, a very young crowd, and um, uh, building here uh, and, and, and going out, building uh, great, um, great products. Um, and uh, how to actually uh, ensure uh, this, uh, that, that this can uh, continue and this is actually developing in a positive way, in a positive trajectory. And what happens maybe to add here when um, those uh, DAOs actually have to close contracts um, uh, with the old world? Yeah, That is probably uh, a topic that uh, is concerning me. Um, Wolf, yeah. <clears throat> so it's all about legal wrappers. So this yeah. is a very sensitive subject for the DevX DAO, which I represent as a co-founder and, and architect. We spent over a year and a half, three years ago that is, just digging into legal designs and we ended up in Switzerland where you are, you are Oliver, I believe. This is oh, the, 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 heaven, the heaven right now, as far as I'm concerned. And I'm biased, yeah. guys, because I'm with the DefX DAO, so I'm completely biased. But the Swiss model association that we drafted with three different legal teams is absolutely beautiful. It allows us to sit, sit on the sites mm -hmm. in a safe haven, run the DAO through a legal wrapper, develop all these um, wallet relationships that are covered by limited liability out of the DAO legal wrapper in Switzerland, and mm -hmm. wait and see what happens in Wyoming and all these other states. One quick um, anecdote. Just to, uh, to a friend of mine, um, I just met in LA. He, he, was, he was present when the Wyoming legislature passed the Dow law. And he met with <laughs> these guys afterwards over drinks and bars. And these guys are literally gunning for a fight with the federal government, okay? Mm -hmm. So as far as I'm concerned, so in this case, it transpired over drinks at night, okay? I know this is anecdotal, so I apologize, but um, you know, people who want to build serious structures, the Wyoming law is for Americans is a way forward, but it will likely result in ten in, a, in about a decade of litigation until we all know how this works. Um, mm -hmm. It also doesn't address the the federal securities law issue. And mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, we can all we can all comfortably sit in Switzerland and see how American lawsuits turn out uh, bef before we we venture into this. Now, of course, America is the biggest market. We all want that to succeed, right? So um, it's very, very important to get this right. Very, very interesting statement. And I know because I've been in discussions with uh, Nicolas on the Wyoming uh, options because we are discussing here uh, several uh, projects already uh, where we had this issue in a let's say a uh, uh, DAO uh, construct that uh, tries to um, yeah, build a community around stars and celebrities uh, where you could uh, basically tokenize their, um, their reach um, uh, in, in, in social media uh, and how to set this up, the whole governance structure and so on and so forth. So I think we will take that uh, discussion further. And I personally also, because I look at the, uh, at the time, um, we, we have one more round, let's say, um, to, uh, to wrap this up. Um, I would like and love to continue this conversation with all of you. Um, <laughs> Also, in the context of uh, of the projects uh, we are currently planning here in in uh, the carbon stablecoin uh, topic, for instance, uh, we are addressing also probably in this uh, topics with the celebrities. Um, now, um, if I uh, give the word again here to Philip and. Uh,
and then uh, to Nicolas, um, what are your biggest um, topics, uh, let's say the topics that keep you up uh, and, and uh, awake at night, let's say in, in um, moving forward in establishing uh, the structure right now, yeah, for the next, let's say a few months or so. I think that uh, Wolf has already tackled this issue uh, because Spool, for instance, was started as a, as a pure DAO, so a DAO first project. There was no actual single entity or person involved in creating it. It was a, a pretty large group of people, uh, what we call the pre-DAO, that then set essentially the parameters for what ultimately became the, the Spool DAO. And now we're looking at so several options to sort of create a foot foothold in the traditional world that actually can sign certain contracts and so on so right now there is no real like nothing that super pressures us into that direction because again it's like we have the luxury of our product being a freely accessible stack of smart contracts and uh, that makes it a little bit simpler but still at some point if you essentially start hiring service providers uh, or start like signing contracts and so on that's when you start to require like some sort of entity that like undertakes these things because uh, like, for us, it's a luxury to sit in our decentralized world and, and do, do, do all of this like that. But as soon as you get to someone that uh, wants just to have a regular job and you want to hire them, they will require a proper contract and not some, uh, something like, oh, we're gonna send some stable coins your way every month and that's it. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the, the thing that we're pursuing right now. We already have a few avenues. Uh, Wolf just gave me another one to research. So thank you for that. Hey, everybody, yeah, I, um, I have to, unfortunately, yeah. oh, I think are, uh, one, just 30 seconds, Nicolas. Uh, yeah, uh, perfect. Yeah. I mean, generally, and this may be a bit bold. I'm a big fan of the statement, like guys like Jamie Burke coin, like nation states will subordinate to the metaverse at some point, but this is quite far away. And, mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest thing or the, the most crucial thing for me is to just to protect everyone involved from liability. I mean, that's the core aspect that you have to do when you establish a DAO. And um, from our side, I mean, like I see generally two types of DAOs, right? The DAO LLC slash digital legal entity model, which to me is it's, it's the more decentralized legal entity, which is not necessarily a DAO. Um, and then the true decentralized DAOs where entities fulfill the role of contributors maybe to the DAO that fulfill certain yeah, tasks or contribute certain resources or even have that liability aspect. Um, so that's from my side quickly in a nutshell. Sorry, um, Wolf, uh, guys, thanks a lot. We are running out of time. I have to uh, hand over and hand back to uh, Carl. I hope that we stay in touch uh, and uh, um, continue the discussion uh, offline in a different context. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. Great. Thank you, guys. Bye.